This is uh, Avijit Barai. <clears throat> In this video, we are going to uh, talk about um, how to write critical appraisal of the randomized control trial or RCT. As you um, understand that randomized control trial is uh, regarded as a very high standard of the evidence. However, before you apply the findings of the randomized control trial to your clinical practice, you need to have a very good uh, critical appraisal of the paper. Whether it is in the journal club or writing an article or reviewing uh, a summary of some similar type of randomized control trials, uh, writing some guidelines for your clinical practice. These are all the applications for the critical appraisal of randomized control trial and that is what we are going to learn or practice in this session. If you have got any questions, please uh, drop me a line down in the comment section and I will try to answer the question as soon as I can. So without any further delay, let's see what is in the menu. So at first what we'll do is we'll talk about briefly what is critical appraisal and why you need to know this in the first place. And this is basically a bit of uh, repetition from the previous presentation, uh, but it may create some uh, background for uh, this particular presentation as well. Then we'll talk about uh, in details about all the steps that you need to follow to write the critical appraisal of the randomized control trial or an RCT. And this is, the, this is where the money is. This is where I'm going to talk about all the steps in details. And if you follow these steps, you will have a very good understanding about the uh, about writing the critical appraisal or creating a critical appraisal or presenting a critical appraisal in your day-to-day um, -day, uh, practice. Of course, uh, we'll show you some tips and tricks and show you some examples as well. Um, if you have not done already, please uh, subscribe to the channel and also press uh, the um, bell icon below so that uh, we can keep you updated with the new videos uh, every week or so. All right, so at first, what is critical appraisal? So we need to understand what is critical appraisal, what are the different components before we uh, dip into uh, uh, the details of the critical appraisal of the RCT. So this is a very nice presentation uh, from this booklet by Amanda Burles from the University of Oxford and she defined critical appraisal as a careful and systematic examination of the research to judge the trustworthiness and the value and relevance in a particular context. What it necessarily means is that Every paper that is published, every randomized trial that is uh, published is not necessarily uh, good for your practice. So before we apply this particular uh, randomized control trial to our clinical practice, we need to identify what are the strengths of the paper, what are the weaknesses of the paper, to find out what are the different um, uh, characteristics, like uh, is it valid? Is it reliable? If we use the same technique, can we get the same result? And the most importantly, can we apply the finding to our clinical practice? So this is all about, uh, in short, what critical appraisal is all about. So if we uh, go through the article, we need to find out in details what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what are the validity, what are the reliability, what are the generalizability? Can we, can we generalize the findings to a large population and what are the applicability of that particular paper. So that is what uh, is critical appraisal. Now before we get into the further details let's see what a randomized control trial or a research or evidence-based medicine is all about. At first we identify a clinical problem and then we ask the question that um, um, to, to identify if this clinical, uh, if this uh, piece of evidence is actually going to be useful or not. And this question is asked on the basis of a few things. What are the population? What are the interventions? What are the comparison? And what is the outcome? And then we perform a thorough literature search from various databases. For example, we can uh, do the search in uh, the Cochrane a review a search engine in Google Scholar. We can do it in PubMed, Cine Hall, 
uh, Scopus. There are so many different search engines full of lots of lots of randomized control trials and we can we can identify the relevant papers from there. And the next step is the critical appraisal. And we need to do it in a very systematic way so that we can make the best use of those articles which we have just picked up from the uh, databases. And then we decide what uh, we are going to do. Can we apply it in our clinical practice? And then we evaluate, we, we do the auditing and find out if actually this is making any difference, a positive or negative difference. So this is all about the evidence-based medicine. And as we can see, in the center of the evidence-based medicine, we have got critical appraisal. So we need to understand critical appraisal really, really well before we apply this in our clinical practice. So why do you need critical appraisal? So as we have mentioned, the critical appraisal uh, can be very useful there, is l there are a lot of uh, randomized control trials in the databases, a lot of information there, but we need to identify what is actually relevant and what is, so it's, it's like uh, picking up the needle in the hair stock, but we need to do it in a very systematic way and that is why, that is why uh, this is so important. We need to identify if it is clinically relevant. For example, there may be some uh, randomized control trial on the dogs or the horses. Can we apply it in human beings? Probably not. Maybe, but most of the time we can't. If a randomized control trial is done in a different healthcare setting than what we practice, again, probably it is not quite clinically relevant. We cannot apply that particular piece of evidence to our clinical practice. Is it reliable? Is it replicable? If we use the same methodology, can we get the same result? This is very important because if the exam, if, if the if the study does not have the good reliability, probably it cannot be applied in clinical practice. That is why when we uh, do the critical appraisal of the randomized control trials, we need to specifically focus on the methodology. Because in method methodology, all the details will be there about the uh, about what steps were taken, what intervention was done, when it was done, what is the time duration, who has done it, and also what was found. So that is the methodology, and this methodology is useful because if we do the same study again, we can use the same methodology, and we try to find out if we get the same result or not. If we do not get the same result, that means this particular uh, study has got poor reliability or replicability, which is which means that the 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 study is not quite rigorous. It's not a very good piece of evidence. Similarly, there is a validity of the study in terms of external validity and internal validity. We need to identify. We need to identify the uh, the cream of the evidence from all the garbage out there. And that is that is when we need the uh, uh, the critical appraisal of the paper. We need to identify what are the strengths and the weaknesses, and most of the time the weaknesses are the different types of bias that the particular randomized control trial might have. And the most important thing why we need the uh, critical appraisal is to identify if we apply these findings to our clinical practice in our uh, place of work. I think that is the most important thing. And of course, uh, there is some other importance of uh, knowing the critical appraisal very well. For example, if you participate in the journal club and if there is some randomized control trial, you need to understand really very well how to do the critical appraisal of this particular paper. Otherwise, you will not be able to participate in the journal club or make the best use of it and to pass the exams. I mean, if you do the master's or PhD or even the bachelor's degree, you will have to participate in various types of assignments, dissertation and thesis, and that is all about critical appraisal. So you need to know critical appraisal really, really well to pass those exams and which will help you in, the, in your career. So there, not, not all science is good science, so there is some bad science and the good science, and we need to pick up what is the good science so that we can apply it to our clinical practice, and what is bad science which we can avoid or discard. 
Let me give you one funny example. So about 100 years ago, there were this type of ads in the newspaper of uh, America. They used to publish this type of ads on the basis of some research, a science. For example, this nice doctor who is quite happy and who is who is who is loving this specific brand of cigarettes and he was to advocate the smoking cigarettes apparently it was very good for your body and on the, the basis on which these particular ads were published was that they performed some survey on 20,679 physicians saying luckies are less irritable less irritating and it is toasted and physicians support the um, this uh, cigarette and physicians say that if you smoke cigarettes then that reduce your cough and that is a big sample size although it is a survey it is not a randomized control trial but still what I am trying to say is this is ridiculous if the doctors are supposed to say that actually cigarette smoking is helpful and not all the cigarettes a specific brand cigarettes right like this nice doctor is saying that camel cigarettes are very good for your body. And this nice doctor also is saying with, with a stethoscope around the neck and he's a very, very, he's a very comfortable in smoking the cigarettes. But nowadays, if we talk about this, then, then that will be a crime. So as you can see that all this science is not a good science. There is a lot of garbage out there. And we need to pick up that specific garbage and discard it and find the good science and apply that to our clinical practice. And same is applicable for the randomized control trials. Right? So how to spot the bad science? So if there is some sensationalized headline, how to write the headline in, random, uh, in the randomized control trial? I'll show you in a minute. And so if you read the randomized control trial heading, you will understand what is all about. But if there is some sensationalized headline, probably this is garbage. Sometimes there may rep the result may be misreported. That is why do not just read the abstract. Read the whole article, especially the methodology and result. That is where the money is. If the result says something but the conclusion is different, that is misrepresentation of the result. That is misinterpretation of the result, which is a bad science. Many of the uh, pharmaceutical companies and other industries, they pay the doctors and other researchers to perform the research to promote their products. So that is a big conflict of interest. So always uh, try to identify if there is any specific conflict of interest by the researcher so that we can identify the potential bias and we can take this uh, piece of randomized control trial with a pinch of salt. Similarly, uh, we need to be very careful about, uh, about this generalization of the correlation or cause-effect um, phenomenon. Uh, if there is some cause, there may be some effect, but not necessarily that is found all the time because there may be a lot of other issues that can affect the uh, effect. Unsupported conclusion, as I have just said, that uh, the conclusion may be completely different from the result. That is why go through the result in a systematic way so that you can identify if the conclusion is actually correct or the authors are actually making some mistakes there. Usually the randomized control trials have got a reasonable size of the sample because when the randomized control trial protocol is uh, written, they do some statistical analysis to make sure that minimal sample size, size is chosen. And if the sample size is less than that minimum size, then probably the statistical power will not be achieved. So make sure that that sample size, how they have calculated the sample size to get the, for example, 95% confidence, confidence interval and the p-value of uh, less than 0.05%, as, as the conservative means is actually uh, reliable or not because if the sample size is not good enough probably we are uh, losing some uh, significant amount of statistical power 
Again, uh, the un un unrepresentative samples can be a problem because uh, when the research is performed, we need to make sure that the sample is actually representing the actual patients. Because if the samples are, are not representative of the actual population, that is not a very good sign. That is a bad sign. And of course, uh, in any randomized control trial, the name itself implies that there is a control group. So there is a, an intervention group and a control group. And the comparison is made between the intervention group and the control group to find out what is the difference. Blinding is a part of the uh, good randomized control trials. Unfortunately, for the best interest of the patient, sometimes the blinding may not be performed. But uh, if it is a double blind, then that is better. So the patient should, be, should not be aware what type of intervention is given. The physician or the clinician is not aware about what the intervention is given. And the person who is measuring the outcome is not aware what is the intervention given. That is triple blind. But usually double blind is good enough. Um, but if the blinding process is not conducted, probably uh, that reduces the uh, validity of the study. And of course, uh, make sure that the authors are not cherry picking the results. That is, uh, that decreases the rigor of the study. Uh, of course, there is um, reliability is very important, as we have mentioned, that give a special focus to the um, methodology. And if the methodology is applied to another place by the another clinicians, then are they getting the same result or different result? That is why the reliability or replicability is very important. And the last but not the least is uh, non-peer-reviewed materials are not very good um, uh, evidence. Almost all the randomized control trials should be peer-reviewed. And if they are not peer-reviewed, probably they are not of a uh, good piece of evidence. So in summary, we can identify the bad signs by looking at these 12 uh, areas. For example, if there is a sensationalized headline, if there is misinterpretation of the results, if there is conflict of interest, especially funding, if there is, um, if there is correlation and causation is achieved um, without a rigorous method, if there is unsupported conclusion, if there are problems in the sample size, especially small sample size, if there is unrepresentative samples used, no control groups used, no blinding done, selective reporting or cherry picking is done, if there is unreplicable or unreliable results, and if there is non-peer reviewed materials, this is bad science, this is bad randomized control trial. So there are different bias, selection bias for example, publication bias once the uh, paper is published in a specific journal. There can be some language uh, bias. Most of the journals are English uh, language journals, but there is still, there is significant amount of journals published in other languages, for example, German language, uh, French language, uh, Korean, Japanese, Chinese. These are the um, journals. They can have some really good um, uh, evidence, randomized control trials, for example. And of course, um, there may be a bit of a citation bias and multiple publication bias. Now briefly, the study design, of course, we are talking about the qua quantitative study, which is the uh, randomized uh, control trials, um, which is a, a pretty much a, go go it's a gold standard of the, of the um, study design. So what is done is the samples at first, uh, they are allocated into two groups in a randomized way, usually computer generated randomized numbers. And, and then the outcome is uh, compared between the two groups to find out if that uh, result was completely out of nowhere by chance, or actually there is some statistically significant difference between these two groups. Sometimes there may be more than two groups, there may be three groups, which can be, or there can be some subgroup analysis, so that can make it even more complicated. But at least there should be two groups, control group and the intervention group. 
When there are multiple randomized control trials are performed in the same topic in different areas, then we can pull this data set and we can perform a systematic review. And when we take the pooled sample size, then that is a meta-analysis. So as you can see, there are a lot of different study designs, but today's focus in this particular presentation is randomized control trial. So this is a little pyramid that I'm going to show you just to have some uh, good idea about what the randomized con control trial is all about. So there is a lot of expert opinion, editorials, lab studies, review articles. They belong to the lower um, hierarchy of the evidence. Above it, we have got the case reports, case series, some observational studies, including the cohort studies, case controller studies, and above it, we have got the randomized control trials. But as you can see, the randomized control trials are not at the highest peak of the pyramid. When there are multiple randomized control trials, they um, are reviewed in a systematic way. This is called systematic review and meta-analysis. And when we take all these together, and apply to our clinical practice by writing some guidelines, synopsis, that actually is the highest um, hierarchy of the, of the medical evidence. So if you are asked to perform a randomized control trial, uh, a critical appraisal, where are you going to start? There are a lot of materials out there. For example, if you go to the Equator Network, they have got the checklists from, uh, from specific uh, validated tools. You can use those and I'm, I'm going to show you uh, one of them. There is another uh, called CASP. They have got, um, uh, they have got uh, some uh, materials and in Scotland they have got some materials as well and uh, the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine they have got some materials. So you can use all of them or one of them. My preference I like the Equator Network because their materials are very precise, crispy, and you can use it quite easily. There is some PDF files you can download or some Word documents you can download or have a printout and you can just tick boxes or go through the, those to, to perform the critical appraisal of the randomized control trial or RCT. So how to perform critical appraisal, how to write the critical appraisal of an RCT? That is exactly what we are going to discuss here. So before you go to the checklist, uh, just, uh, this, is, this is a, a broad outline. So first of all, before you perform the critical appraisal, you need to identify, is it relevant to my clinical practice? Or am I doing something which is not relevant, which is not useful? That's not going to be very helpful. So. Before we perform the critical appraisal, we need to make sure that this uh, piece of paper or piece of evidence is actually relevant to our clinical practice. And next question is, is it actually going to help us? Is it going to add anything new to the evidence in my field? And what type of research question is asked? Right? And we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. So... When the research question comes, uh, we have got this uh, little um, formula that we use, something called PICO. So PICO is P for population. So what are the people, what are the group of individuals or the patients where this particular randomized control trial was performed? What intervention was given? Is it some drugs? Is it some treatment? Is it some operation? Is it some investigation like some ultrasound or a CT scan? So that is the intervention. And then what happened? And what are the comparison between the two groups or multiple groups? And that is the outcome. So that is the, that, that is the specific clinical question that is answered through this uh, uh, formula or PICO. And then next question is, was the study design appropriate for research? Is it a randomized control trial a good way to answer to that uh, particular research question or should you have done different, something different? So that is the study design. That is why we need to understand the methodology very well because methodology is a section of the randomized control trial where the study design is elaborated. Sometimes to elaborate the study design, a protocol is published beforehand prior to publishing the randomized control trial itself. 
And in the methodology, when we go through the methodology, you can find out if there is any bias. Um, and as I've said that there may be some protocol before the randomized control trial was published. We need to go through the protocol to find out if actually the protocol was followed or is there some deviation from the protocol to some place, something different. Every randomized control trial should have a hypothesis or an objective and we need to find out if that particular hypothesis was uh, stated clearly and it was followed and was answered. Statistical analysis, that is this, that is big science, that is all numbers, and uh, the statistical analysis should be performed correctly to um, have a good uh, rigorous process of the randomized control trial. And as I've said, read the conclusion, but at the same time, read the uh, result section to identify is if actually the, the conclusion is different from the result or actually the conclusion is representing what is written in the result. Is there any funding? Is there any conflict of interest? Because if there is some conflict of interest, then probably there is some bias in that, uh, in that paper. And again and again, we are talking about the applicability. Can we actually apply the finding of this randomized control trial to our clinical practice? So let's uh, go through the consort guidelines. So this is the specific guideline or the checklist that we use for writing the critical appraisal of the randomized control trial. And we will go through this in details. So consort stands for Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials. In 1993, at first, the Standards of Reporting Trials was developed in Ottawa, Canada. I think there were 30 researchers who had a uh, gathering and they decided that we will develop these SORT guidelines. At the same time, just next year, uh, a Salomar group from California made a um, similar type of proposal. And in 1996, both SORT and Salomar groups sat together and the, 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 the guidelines or the checklist, they are merged together. And so there are 30 points or 32 points in these consort guidelines where um, we can uh, use the uh, checklist for uh, performing the critical appraisal of the uh, randomized control trials. So that is about consort. If you can, uh, if you go to the Equator network, you can download to the uh, uh, checklist and that checklist can be used for the randomized control trial critical appraisal. So the first thing when we do the ran, uh, critical appraisal of the randomized control trial, we read the title and the abstract. In the title, it should be mentioned that this is a randomized control trial. Otherwise, the readers might think it is maybe an observational study. It may be a case report. It may be just an opinion piece. God knows what. So the term randomized control trial or RCT should be mentioned in the title. If not, then probably uh, probably that uh, that we are missing something. And then we, when we read the abstract, usually this is written in a structured way. For example, study design or trial design, methodology, results, and the conclusions. If this is not followed, then why it was not followed also needs to be investigated. And sometimes the authors might uh, write some explanation, but I have not seen any randomized control trial where these two points are not fulfilled. Next section of the randomized control trial is the introduction. And in introduction, we look for two things. One is the background, why it was done. And that is based on a a, a thorough uh, literature review of relevant articles. There may be some clinical problems that the authors try to identify answer or there may be some new uh, disease process, for example, COVID-19. And when they started treatment, different types of treatment modalities came into play and they performed the randomized control trial. So there is some problem and if there is some problem, we try to answer some specific question. And that is uh, what is written in the introduction section. 
Now, in case of the critical appraisal of RCT, we need to find out if there is any hypothesis or an objective. For example, they might say that there are two groups and we hypothesize that there is no statistically significant difference between the two groups. So that particular hypothesis or objective should be clearly written in the introduction section. And the most important part of the RCT is the methodology. In the methodology, the authors should write the trial design including the allocation ratio and the allocation ratio usually it is one is to one all the time. There are two, two groups, one is the intervention group, the other one is the control group and usually that is one is to one. And this study, trial design can be parallel that simultaneously we are doing it or they can be factorial. Sometimes they can be, um, they can change the group alternatively between two and fourth. Um, and then um, in the methodology also we need to find out in details that when it was done, where it was done and in case of the participants we need to identify what are the eligibility criteria and the eligibility criteria are two types inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria are for example age more than 18 years that is these are the adult patients or below 18 years that is the pediatric patients or between 18 and 60 years or elderly population so say for example more than 70 years so that is the eligibility inclusion criteria similarly the exclusion criteria should be followed as well and that will help us to identify who are the people who are the patients where this particular randomized control trial was performed then a specific setting should be uh, clearly demonstrated for example there can be two different hospitals what are the different types of hospitals is it a teaching hospital is it a tertiary hospital or is it a, some rural center right um, is it an R1 hospital um, and also we need to make sure that uh, there is some clear uh, mention of the interventions for example is it any specific drug what is the dose of the drug what is the root of the drug what is the time or what time interval of the dose? Is it once a day? Is it three times a day? Uh, these are the th intervention uh, that should be clearly demonstrated or written in the methodology section. A very clear um, demonstration should be there about the outcome. What was achieved? Is it the length of a stay in the hospital? Is it the length of a stay in the MRC department? Is it mortality? Is it actually uh, improvement of the clinical symptoms for example pain so that is the outcome and there can be different types of outcome the main outcome on the basis of which this particular RCT was written that is um, called primary outcome but also there can be multiple secondary outcomes for example length of stay in the hospital mortality complications this sort of things if there is any change of the outcome after the trial commenced then that needs to be also written. For example, if there is some adverse reaction from the drug which was not expected beforehand, that can be um, an outcome and that should be mentioned as well. A very important uh, aspect of the randomized control trial is a sample size. So there is uh, different softwares that can give us the what is the minimum sample size that we need to choose. For example, the statistical analysis might say that if we have total 100 sample, 50 sample in each group, then that will give us um, that will give us uh, enough statistical power, at least 80% power, and uh, that will give us the uh, p-value of less than 0 0.05, which means that the outcome will be achieved not by chance. So that is a very conservative mean. You can set your own p-value. P if you say my p-value is less than 0 0.01, which means that by chance you can get the same result in one patient out of 100 patients. So that is how the sample size is chosen. Now, if we have got total 100 patients, it's very likely that some of the patients might not get follow-up. So we usually add another 20% on the top of it. So, for example, you can take total 120 patients, 20 of them might actually uh, be uh, removed from uh, the analysis because 
of different complications, mortality and other things. And so ultimately we'll get 100 and then we can put 50 in that intervention group and 50 in the uh, placebo group or the control group. So that is how the sample size is calculated. When applicable, explanation of any interim analysis or stopping guidelines. For example, at the middle of the study, the study may be interrupted. Um, I was doing a critical appraisal of the DASH-2 um, randomized control trial, which, is, which was done worldwide. It's a, it's a big randomized control trial. And when I was doing the critical appraisal, I found that many of the hospitals suddenly stopped giving the tranexamic acid in the trauma patients. And that was not explained in the text itself, why it was stopped and um, actually how it is going to affect the ultimate result. In methodology also a very clear demonstration should be there about the randomization process. So for example, the sequence generation, how the numbers are created, is it based on some computer algorithm, right? Um, and also the type of uh, randomization, was there any restriction, for example, blocking and the block size, that should be demonstrated there as well. After the randomization is done, how was it implemented? And most of the time it will be blinded, so that the kinesium is not aware of it, but for some reason, for the best interest of the patient, um, it may be implemented in a different way. It needs to be clearly demonstrated in the RCT uh, paper that how it was implemented, the randomization process. And then the allocation concealment mechanism. Uh, when we say concealment means there is some blinding process. And if the concealment mechanism is uh, dodgy and if this uh, concealment mechanism is questionable, that means the outcome may be affected badly. So that, that means it is a poor quality randomized control trial. As I have mentioned several times that invariably all the randomized control trials have got some blinding process in place and it can be double blinded so the, both the clinician and the patients are not aware what type of intervention was given um, but at least one of them should be blinded. If the blinding is not done, that means this is not a very good quality randomized control trial. That group need to be scrutinized why the blinding was not done and how it is going to affect the interpretation of the results. If relevant, description of the similarity of the intervention. So, for example, the placebo and the uh, intervention uh, should be similar type. They, they, they should not be completely just normal saline. There should be something there in the placebo that is comparable to the intervention as well. Now statistics is all about science, it's all about numbers and so the statistical methods uh, should be clearly uh, clearly demonstrated. Um, for example, what statistical software was used. Personally I like R but uh, the other, there are lots of other softwares. For example, Strata is a software um, uh, there, 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 there is SPSS that is very widely used as well. So what a statistical method was used, uh, for example, if it is numerical data or if it is, the, uh, if it is uh, not numerical data, the outcome for example, if it is not numerical or qu quantitative data, um, then the uh, statistical test may be different. For example, the t-test, that is uh, t-square test, that is done in case of the numerical uh, outcome data or quantitative data. But if there is qualitative data, then we can use the chi-square or Pearson chi-square chi correlation. These are the different types of statistical methods that can be used. So methods for addition analysis, for example, for subgroup analysis and adjusted analysis, that should also be uh, demonstrated in the RCT. In the, um, usually in case of the randomized control trial, there is a flow, patient flow or participant flow. Um, the consort guidelines, it has got your own flow chart and I'm going to show you that in a second. And that usually shows exactly how the allocation was done, how the 
um, patient uh, follow-up was done and how the analysis was done. If th this gives us uh, the synopsis about the patient flow and also it helps us to find out what are the patients who are actually removed from the final analysis. It's a very important aspect. So the first thing in case of the randomized control trial is obviously enrollment. For example, if we use the inclusion and exclusion criteria and if we find that certain number of patients do not fulfill the inclusion criteria or there are some of the patients who actually decline to give the consent for participation in the RCT or if there is some any other reason that these are the number of the patients who are excluded. The rest of the patients then are randomized and this randomization process most of the time is performed by the computerized randomization process. These patients are allocated usually into two arms or two groups. On one side we have got the intervention group where uh, there is a number of the patients who, who receive the intervention but again there are some of the patients who may not receive the intervention and why this uh, has happened needs to be elaborated as well. Of course in the other arm of the allocation we have got the placebo group or the control group. Again, we need to mention the number of the patients who are in the placebo group or the control group. And if somebody did not participate, then why it was not done, that also needs to be elaborated. Of course, during the follow-up, our, our main goal will be to identify the outcome, which can be some qualitative or quantitative outcome. Now, during the follow-up, of course, in clinical practice, we find that some of the patients may not uh, may not be followed up because they have either left the uh, hospital or left uh, to uh, different uh, locality. Some patients may die. So there may be some loss of follow-up that needs to be mentioned. What is the number? And of course, uh, discontinuation of the intervention. So during the trial period, in the middle of it, sometimes the uh, intervention may not continue. Similarly, on the placebo group, the similar type of follow-up should be mentioned. The final part is the analysis, and in the analysis section, we have got the rest of the patients and the rest of the data. And uh, this is the actual uh, cream of all the data set that needs to be uh, interpreted in a very systematic way. Uh, and the comparison is made between the placebo group and the intervention group. So this is the flow chart I was talking about and any randomized control trial should have this type of flow chart so that we have a very good understanding exactly what has happened and when this has happened, how this has happened. In the results section, the recruitment process should be clearly demonstrated, especially there should be mention of the dates defining the period of the recruitment process. How long the follow-up is done is very important. Most of the studies have a follow-up of uh, about six months at least. And why the trial ended or interrupted for some reason, that needs to be cl clearly mentioned as well. In the results section, there, is, there should be at least one table demonstrating the demographic characteristics and the clinical characteristics of the patients. For example, age, sex, uh, ethnicity, and uh, the health, uh, for example, blood pressure, height, weight, BMI, ASA uh, grading, this sort of things. And the clinical characteristics are also mentioned in this baseline table. The actual uh, data should be presented in different tables, figures, flowcharts, um, etc. The outcomes and the estimation for each primary and the secondary outcome, they should be presented adequately with estimated effect size and this precision, for example, 95% confidence interval. For the binary outcome, um, so basically uh, this is a dichotomous uh, outcome, yes or no, present or absent. Presentation of both absolute and relative effect size is recommended. In the result also, uh, the ancillary analysis should be performed, for example, subgroup analysis. One important aspect of the randomized control trial is to identify if there is any harm, unintentional harm to the patients because that will affect the, uh, about the applicability of this particular uh, randomized control trial. So you need to identify if that harms are mentioned or not and how they are uh, addressed. 
any good randomized control trial should have some amount of limitation. The limitations are, for example, different types of bias. It is not about the mention of the bias, it is about how that bias was addressed uh, to reduce the um, limitation process. A generalizability is a very uh, big thing and most of the time the generalizability can be achieved if the same study was performed in multiple different hospitals in completely different countries or different localities. That will increase the validity and applicability of this uh, paper. In the discussion section, uh, again uh, the authors perform a, a brief summary of what was actually found in the result and also how it actually compares with the contemporaneous medical literature. So that is the interpretation. In the um, remaining section of the randomized control trial also there should be some details about the registration process, ethics committee approval and usually any randomized control trial should be registered in the trial registry. As I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the randomized control trials actually write a protocol even before the data collection has been started and that protocol should be, a source of the protocol should be mentioned if available. There should be clear mention of the randomized control trial funding because that can be a potential source of bias and there is a conflict of interest as well. So what I have told you so far that is basically is available free of charge in the equator network so if you go there there is this uh, consort checklist and also the flow diagram that I have just shown you. Um, there are also other uh, checklists that you can find for other types of study but obviously the gold standard of any research is the randomized control trial and we can perform the uh, effective uh, critical appraisal process by using the consort guidelines or consort statement. So in summary so far we have uh, briefly talked about what is critical appraisal as a background. We have talked about what are the benefits and why you need to do the critical appraisal of a randomized control trial in the first place. I have shown you in a stepwise fashion in a bit of a details about how to write the critical appraisal or perform or present the critical appraisal of a randomized control trial. If you use these steps, I am confident that you will be able to uh, get the best out of the randomized control trial. I have given you some tips and tricks and also have given you some examples, especially uh, the checklists from the, cons uh, from the um, equator network. The specific checklist that I use for randomized control trial is consort guidelines or consort statement. This, is, um, this makes the life so easy. So in the center stage of this presentation is obviously the steps. Please follow the steps of this uh, appraisal of the critical appraisal um, of the randomized control trials and I'm pretty sure it will become like a piece of cake to you. So if you follow these steps it will uh, initially probably take a bit of a time but ultimately you will achieve the goal and uh, just like that uh, rabbit and I'm pretty sure you will be benefited. If if you want to know more about the randomized control trial critical appraisal, uh, there are lots of papers out there. You can go through them. These are, uh, most of them are pretty um, recent paper. Uh, the consort, the latest consort guideline is actually from 2010. Since then there is no new uh, statement or explanation, but still it is uh, relevant and this is still a gold mine. You can use these consort guidelines to perform the critical appraisal of the RCTs. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope that you find this useful. If you still have got any questions or um, if you want to know anything, please uh, drop me a line. I'll be happy to uh, answer to your questions. Thank you very much. Bye for now.